Let's start off by going over some basic anatomy. The occipital condyles are paired protrusions that project off the occipital bone. The condyles articulate with the superior articular process of C1 to form the atlanto-occipital joint. C1 is often referred to as the atlas, and C2 is often referred to as the axis. C1 is unique because it does not have a body and is instead a ring-shaped structure. C1 has bilateral superior articular processes that articulate with the occipital condyles. C1 has an anterior arch and a posterior arch, as well as two transverse processes. Anteriorly, C1 has an articular surface that allows for articulation with the dens of C2 to form part of the atlantoaxial joint. The transverse foramen contain the vertebral arteries. C2's most unique feature is the dens, or odontoid process, which is a superiorly directed conical extension of C2. The dens plays an important role in rotation of the head. C2 also has two transverse processes. Like C1, C2 has two transverse foramen, which contain the vertebral arteries. Two superior articular processes articulate with the lateral masses of C1 to form the atlantoaxial joint. The two inferior articular processes articulate with C3. Let's now look at some of the key ligaments of the craniocervical junction. The transverse ligament is one of the strongest ligaments and it runs posterior to the dens and the anterior arch of the atlas. This ligament is one of the primary stabilizers of the atlantoaxial joint. It limits extension of the neck and therefore it makes sense that the transverse ligament is usually injured in the setting of severe hyperextension injuries. The transverse ligament actually forms the horizontal component of a cross-shaped cruciate ligament. The more vertical band of the cruciate ligament connects the body of C2 to the clivus. If we look on the sagittal view, you can see the longitudinal band of the cruciate ligament extending from the clivus to C2. Just posterior to the cruciate ligament is the tectorial membrane. The more inferior extension of the tectorial membrane is referred to as the posterior longitudinal ligament. The apical ligament connects the tip of the dens to the basion. The basion forms the anterior margin of the foramen magnum, which is shown here. The alar ligaments attach to the posterior margin of the dens and slope upwards to attach to the lateral margins of the foramen magnum. The alar ligaments limit rotation and lateral movement of the head. The alar ligaments and the transverse ligament are the most important stabilizers of the atlantoaxial joint. Let's now move on to the imaging. CT is usually the best initial imaging in patients with suspected traumatic injury of the cervical spine. MRI is frequently used to evaluate for ligamentous injuries or surgical planning. Atlanto-occipital dislocation, or AOD for short, often occurs in the setting of high-speed MVC collisions. Frequently, this injury is immediately fatal because of injury to the brainstem or vessels. However, up to 20% of patients with AOD will have a normal neuro exam, and therefore sometimes the diagnosis will be delayed. The mechanism of injury is felt to likely be the result of severe hyperextension. The best first test is CT, given that radiographs can miss up to half of cases of AOD. AOD is far more common in children. A key point to remember on call is that children, especially young children, rarely fracture their cervical spine because their bones are very malleable. So even if you do not find any fractures, look very closely for any signs of ligamentous injury. Given the gravity of the diagnosis, have a very low threshold to recommend MRI. There are three types of atlanto-occipital dislocation. Knowing the specific numbers is not important, just understand the concepts. Type 1 is anterior displacement of the head relative to the atlas. Type 2 is distraction of the head from the atlas. Type 3 is a posterior displacement of the occiput relative to the atlas. Let's review some cases. Here's an example of AOD in a 9-year-old. 
there is a component of type 2 AOD as evidenced by an increase in the Bayesian to Dens distance. A Bayesian to Dens measurement of greater than 5 mm in adults and greater than 10 mm in kids is highly concerning for AOD. In this case, the Bayesian to Dens measures 13 mm. Over time, you will develop a gestalt for what's normal. However, when you first start on call, it may be useful to measure the Bayesian to Dens distance on all pediatric trauma C-spines. As we scroll from side to side, there is further evidence of AOD, with the atlanto-occipital joints being far too wide. There also is a component of type 1 dislocation, with the head and the occipital condyles shifted forward in relation to the atlas. The same is true on the other side, with the occipital condyles shifted forward in relation to the atlas. Always look at the atlanto-occipital joints closely on all projections. The atlanto-occipital joints should be symmetric and should not measure more than 2 mm in adult and 4 mm in kids. The atlanto-occipital joints in this case are asymmetric and measure far more than 4 mm. As mentioned before, the alar ligaments and the transverse ligament are the most important stabilizers of the craniocervical junction. They are usually injured in cases of widening of the Bayesian to Dens interval. Both the Bayesian to Dens interval as well as the atlanto-occipital joint measurements mentioned are referenced in this review illustration, which is included below, as well as on the spine trauma lesson page. Occipital condyle fractures are pretty rare, but familiarity with them is important because they are easy to miss and can be unstable when associated with ligamentous injury. There is a classification system. Type 1 occipital condyle fractures are usually an impaction type fracture that is the result of excessive axial loading. In these fractures, the occipital condyle is usually comminuted and fracture fragments are not typically displaced into the foramen magnum. Type 2 occipital condyle fractures are typically more extensive fractures that are the result of a direct blow to the head. These fractures are linear fractures of the skull base that extend to involve the occipital condyles. These fractures can potentially be associated with ligamentous injury, in which case they are considered 2B. Here is an example of a type 2 acute non-displaced left occipital condyle fracture. As you can tell, these fractures can be very subtle and are easily missed if you're not specifically looking for them. The fracture lucency is also seen on the coronal. Here is another minimally displaced left type 2 occipital condyle fracture. Type 3 occipital condyle fractures are an avulsion type injury involving the alar ligament. As we reviewed earlier in the video, the alar ligament attaches to the inferomedial aspect of the occipital condyles and extends to the posterior aspect of the dens. The alar ligament limits axial rotation and lateral bending. In a high-speed rear end motor vehicle collision, the head oftentimes undergoes maximal rotation and whiplash by the impact, which makes the alar ligaments vulnerable to injury. Here is an example of a type 3 avulsion fracture of the left occipital condyle. Notice a small chip of the occipital condyle is pulled off at the expected site of alar ligament insertion. This avulsed fracture fragment is also apparent on the axial series. Given the potential for associated ligamentous injury, these fractures can be unstable. C1 burst type fractures often go by the name Jefferson fracture. These fractures are frequently the result of an axial load type injury, such as diving into a shallow swimming pool head first. Given that C1 is a ring, fractures usually occur in more than one place. The anterior and posterior arches of C1 are the weakest spots of the ring and most common sites of fracture. Fractures can also be isolated to the anterior arch, posterior arch, or primarily involve a lateral mass. If the lateral mass is displaced laterally or the atlantodens interval is widened, this is concerning for transverse ligament injury, which would likely make the injury unstable. 
Although rare, the transverse ligament can be injured in an avulsion type injury. If you see a small bony fragment in the region of the transverse ligament attachment to the atlas, consider this possibility. Here's a pretty extensive Jefferson fracture with four parts. They are fractures of the anterior and the posterior arches. The displacement of the fracture fragments anteriorly is concerning for possible injury of the transverse ligament, for which MRI could better evaluate. Also notice the extension of the fracture into the left transverse foramen, which is important to recognize and likely warrants a CTA given the vertebral artery courses through this foramen. Here's another Jefferson fracture with fracture of the anterior arch centrally and fracture of the right posterior arch. Additionally, there is a mildly displaced fracture fragment from the medial aspect of the left lateral mass of C1 at the site of the transverse ligament attachment. This is concerning for an avulsion injury of the transverse ligament. The odontoid is frequently also referred to as the dens. Odontoid fractures make up approximately 12% of cervical spine fractures in adults. They are more common in the elderly and have a high morbidity and mortality. Classification plays an important role in how these fractures are managed. Type 1 fractures are rare. They are an avulsion type fracture involving the alar ligament and therefore involve the dontoid peg and are usually oblique. These fractures occur above the transverse ligament. As I've mentioned multiple times now, the alar ligament is key to atlanto-occipital stability and therefore this type of fracture may be associated with instability which would require occiput C2 fusion. These type of fractures do tend to heal well. Type 2 fractures are the most common and occur at the base of the odontoid. These fractures occur below the transverse ligament. Type 2 fractures are unstable and have a high risk of non-union and poor healing. Type 3 fractures make up less than one-third of odontoid fractures. These occur through the odontoid and extend into the lateral masses of C2. Type 3 fractures are relatively stable if there is not significant displacement of the fracture fragments. In addition, type 3 fractures tend to heal better than type 2 fractures because they have a larger bony contact area and better vascular supply. Let's review a few cases. Here is an example of an acute, obliquely oriented type 2 odontoid fracture with posterior displacement of the odontoid relative to the body of C2. On the coronal, you see the fracture line through the base of the dens, and as we scroll posteriorly, you see the displaced odontoid. Here is an example of a subtle type 3 odontoid fracture that involves the right lateral mass of C2. and extends into the body. The fracture is also apparent on the axial view. That's it for